welcome back to another standard array on Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. We're going to make sure the stream is running. PB is going to check out. She can give me the thumbs up as we go. Welcome to the show. I am Sir Lucian of Sir Lucian Gaming. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and right into the intro. I'm your spotty streamer, your part-time GM who dreams of full-time world building. I have fantastically good big ideas, but I only have a minus 10 initiative, so I really don't get much of them done. And then my co-host is here, PB. Go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody out there. Hello, everyone out there. I am PB from PB Blades Inside, which you can find me on pretty much all basic social medias. I don't want to say all social medias anymore because there's so many social medias I'm not on <laughs> because I'm old and cranky and I don't want to get on them. So... Uh, let's see. I am PB. I stream a bunch. You can find me on, uh, let's see. I'm keeping Mondays open for right now. Tuesdays, uh, doing some D and D Wednesdays. I'm making a, a game. I'm making an RPG, a quick, hopefully fun, easy to learn, uh, game called band battles. Uh, and I stream other things like platformers and RPGs like mass effect. A lot of fun stuff. Also, a uh, secret for the world that I've actually announced on my stream, but not a lot of people were there when I did it. I am also writing a couple of one-shots, two to be specific, I guess that's what a couple means, but two one-shots that I'm writing, one for about one to three third levels, and the other one I want to be a five to eight. So those two one-shots are going to be to celebrate Pride Month next month, so things to incorporate into your games or run as just a plain easy one shot and then i'm writing a an extra little i don't know what to call it like a little supplement for the uh for as a festival that you can add into your game again all in celebration of pride month coming up next month in june technically july and august too but june that's me that's me <laughs> i love it um, yeah, and so this is a show about uh, talking about RPGs, and really it's about talking about things other than Dungeons & Dragons, and again, not because we don't love Dungeons & Dragons, me and PB play a lot of Dungeons & Dragons, I love 5th edition, I love running it and playing it, um, I'm constantly bringing all our friends together to play in, in more and more games, but we wanted to, one of our shows to be something that was highlighting or spotlighting or... Um, just getting the word out for these other games that are out there because there are a lot of really good RPGs that maybe many people don't know about or they haven't seen them yet. And we're kind of deep into the hobby now. We're passionate about finding these crazy things. We're, we're going to tell you about Kickstarters at the end of the show that we're, we're into. We're going to always highlight anything new that we're seeing out there, updates and things. If you watched last week's show, we talked about Numenera 2 and Numenera to help you make a good decision if maybe Numenera is the game that you're looking to play and where to you know what it's about why is there these other versions and we just want to make sure that you have a chance to to see all this stuff that we're taking a look at um and there's a lot of great stuff a lot of innovative and creative stuff and it's helping i think i can't wait to see uh play test pb's game because i know all of the rpgs that we're trying out or looking at or reading even if we haven't played them we've read through the rules on many of them they're helping her creativity in building that game and my big 2019 goal is also to try to build a an rpg so that's going to just lead into that kind of stuff so this is going to be a great show for that so if you have questions we'll keep an eye in chat um and if you watch this on youtube hey thanks for dropping by on youtube i know sometimes sunday nights are a little bit hard to get to for the live show but we'll put this up on youtube and you can watch it there too so we've been doing um the last couple shows have been about uh, talking about RPGs that we're interested in. We talked about Mass, a new generation of superhero uh, RPG that I really, really liked and is a really fantastic uh, game that you can play. You can check out the video on that. We then talked about Numenera 2 and what we liked about that. And we really kind of dived into Numenera itself. And then the new couple of things that are coming up, which is called Numenera Destiny and Numenera Discovery and how cool those two items are. And we thought, why not stay in that same vein? Why not stay in that same kind of genre at the moment? Or at least stay with Monty Cook Games, which is the ones that are doing Numenera, 
They also have done The Strange, which was the second RPG that they put out for their company. And so we thought we would dive into the exciting world of The Strange, the system, and we'd talk a little bit about it just in case it's one that you haven't seen or maybe one that you haven't uh, tried out. And then hopefully maybe down the line, we'll cap it off with a session or a show about uh, the Cypher system, which is another RPG they put out. And we'll talk a little, I'll talk about at towards the end, they have a fourth RPG they've created, which is called uh, No Thank You Evil, which is a kids cooperative um, RPG that's out there also. Storytelling cooperative for kids game. So, all right, so let's dive into The Strange. Um, PB, I know you've been reading a lot about it today. Um, I've got to play it. Uh, and I think, oh, we probably didn't even get that part on when we started talking. So let me set it up a little bit. So for me, The Strange, I got introduced to The Strange at Gen Con two years ago. Uh, I went there to play Numenera. I wanted to learn as much as I could about Numenera. And when I tried to sign up for a bunch of Numenera games, I only got in a couple of them because they were so popular that I had some gaps in my schedule. So I had to find some other things I could play. So I noticed that Monty Cook was also doing the Strange and the Cypher system in the in the same room where they were doing Numenera. So I signed up for a Strange game and I signed up for a Cypher system game. And let me tell you, the Numenera game was okay when I played it there. It gave me the confidence I needed to come back and run the Numenera one shot that I wanted to run. It gave me that, okay, I get it now. I, I knew what I needed to do. I had the rules right. It was cool to play through it as a player and see how their GM did it. I'm ready to run my game. The surprise for me from that two years ago was how good and how interesting the strange was. Because when I played in that, I was blown away with the creativity of that game and the adventure we we ran through. And I almost made a mental switch in my head that said, maybe, wait a minute, maybe I should be playing The Strange and get all my friends to play The Strange instead of this whole Numenera thing I set up. So, But I, I stuck with it. We played Numenera and we had a great time. We had a great one shot with Tegan, the clutch NPC of the, of the whole show. Um, and it was a good thing. But let's dive into the strange let's talk a little bit about the strange what is the strange why is it different than numenera which is made by the same company it actually uses the same set of rules loosely or well probably maybe more like 75 80 percent of the rules even though there are things that are different it is a different game not just a different world PB, as you've been reading about it throughout the day and, and, and checking it out and researching this a little bit, what has stood out to you about The Strange so far? I think um, the thing that really stands out to me, aside from the rules, because it's been a long time since I've read the Numenera rules, and I forgot totally how they work, and I was like, oh, that's right, um, is mostly how the world works. And that's the thing that caught my attention immediately because unlike you i had never heard of this i didn't know this was a game i think i'd seen it on the monty cook website before but i thought it was like a an extra supplement for numenera mm -hmm. and i just i didn't even think about it at all so i looked it up yesterday and then today and i was like oh okay and right off the bat it explains to you that the strange is like a very broad term for um i guess things you can't really explain so the idea with the world is that there are people quickened is what they're called are people who can understand can see things that others can't and these things that they can see are uh the different almost alternate worlds universes realities that exist around us uh, mostly in the uh, dark space um, which is 70%, as they explain in the in the book, it's like 70% of our um, of the perceived area, I guess. So, in these alternate places, uh, whenever these people who are quickened, they can translate there, which is like um, sending their consciousness to that place. And when you send your conscious to this place, you change your physicality when you get get there because you it's not you as a person, it is you as a consciousness. So you enter a form in this reality that matches the what that world is like. And in these worlds, um, 
it's sort of like if you guys have read through all of Mordecai and Tome of Bows that just came out uh, two days ago, I guess. Uh, yeah. Which, let me tell you, what a hefty read. Haven't gotten through it. Skim read a lot of it. <laughs> Great book. Totally recommend. Best thing. But that's what we're talking about today. But like that in the beginning, um, the war between the devils and the demons, it's the same thing. Uh, the blood war, I think is what it's called. It, the same thing exists in The Strange, where there is a war uh, or like a there are people who are trying to get into the earth and in this case they're trying to destroy it and there are so many like layers between them and us trying to get there and it is your job as one of these quicken who are working for the estate um the people who work to keep everything in in check it, within the strange and uh the pl the planet no not planet sphere uh, plantosphere or something i think is how you say it yeah yeah I, plano planoverse planovores planovores there you go yeah. planovores and the chaos sphere creatures live in the chaos sphere yep yeah. so the planto planto spheres right no planto planovores yeah planovores are trying to get into the earth and destroy it uh essentially because they think they'll be better off without the earth and they'll be able to exist freely amongst the world because right now they can't really leave um they are stuck between uh where they are their reality and the earth and because we are so rigid in not letting anything through into this world because it could be catastrophic like one of the uh sort of demigods that exist in one of the planes wants to destroy it so like you can hear there is a lot of story which is very different from numenera where it's no story it is you come up with your own story your own lore and you built upon all these eons. And while instead of having artifacts that you find, the ciphers you find in Numenera, my mic kept falling. Um, <laughs> all these things you find there in The Strange, you find you you find them in these alternate realities, and they are items that come from The Strange. That is where these ciphers come from. And only you can see them. Like I said, only the Quicken have this ability. And it is very rare to be a Quicken. And so you have all these different things, all these different abilities to interact with the Strange and how you get to these different realities through uh, this thing called translocation, which is a whole mechanic in the game. And let's see, things that are different from Numenera. Um, I guess the skills are different. Like a lot of the a lot of the rules are very very much the same as Numenera, and I, that's just the Monty Cook like specialty. I guess that is how all their games are going to run just consistently. Mm -hmm. But in this case, instead of having things like the glaive and the jack of all trades and glaive nano jack, yep. Yeah, the nano. Um, you have the vector, the paradox, and. Oh, God, the windbag. I can't remember what the last one's called, <laughs> but it's the one that talks a lot. Uh, sort of like your Jack of Jack of all trades. Um, you have these different three, and all of them work on yes, your physicality and how you are in this universe, but really a lot of their abilities will help you out in an alternate universe. Whether you care, because you still are you uh, to a certain extent as you send your consciousness over. But a lot of your focuses, a lot of your skills are different just due to your meat shield, your meat body mm -hmm. that is on that side. And it talks about how ev everything can be different when you head over there. You could be a different race, a different gender. You could be um, have all this wacky stuff going on. And the coolest thing is that so you have these abilities to see all these different things happening in our world on Earth. But you also have these, um, but and so pe regular people don't know what's happening. But in the alternate universes or the realities, yeah, they know what's happening. It's common. It's a thing that happens all the time. Like, oh, you can manipulate things with your mind. Yeah, Psh. Fred does that like every other second of the day. And oh, when you talk to people, you can convince them to do what you want. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That just looks like you could see it in your eyes. It like does a mm -hmm. lot of cool stuff. So there's a lot of agency that players and gms have to describe how your abilities that are basically invisible on earth work in this other world 
And so it's very fascinating in that way because a lot of the things that are sort of left up in the air in Numenera are caught in this game, in The Strange. And you really get to roll with it, but you still have a lot of, lot of, lot of agency when creating the world and creating your characters and then creating your alternate characters. Yeah. Which can change every single time. So Yeah, what's, what's interesting to me from the, the world set of it is that Numenera really... Um, boasts you're in the ninth world or you're in the ninth age or you're in the ninth um, kind of like dynasty or millennium because it's billions of years ahead of our timeline and there's all these civilizations that have risen and fallen risen and fallen risen and fallen and it's cr kept creating layers and layers and layers of this world and we're finally at this uh, age in Numenera where the people that you are are kind of like stone age people or bronze age people starting to discover that your world used to be a super technological world and what happens when you have you know a group of people that come from very low technology finding out they have technology that's like thousands of years more advanced than us it's like i'm a stone age uh i'm a, a greek you know or i'm a roman and i pick up a phaser from star trek all of a sudden it's that kind of interaction or that kind of thing that you're doing with low tech meets high tech in Numenera, but there's a lot of things you can do with that. And a lot of blurring of the idea that things are so high tech, they, they seem magical in some ways. Like when you start to get to nanos and things like that, the strange brings it back down to it's pretty much current time. It doesn't say like it's a hundred years in the future or a hundred years in the past. It's like, it's now. So your character that you're building is here now and you're dealing with the recursions or these things that are the little bubbles of reality or the bubbles of other worlds that are bumping into our world and they explain how in the in a little bit of the whys of that but a typical game is you're an agent who is meant to make sure that whatever's coming over from the recursion doesn't get over here and mess earth up and sometimes you go over there for specific purposes or missions or to do things also. So you might actually go to that world or go into that recursion and do something. They explain it pretty well in their um, in, in the front of the book if you're reading through The Strange. The one thing I liked that I was going to read out is they talk about recursions in The Strange. So stable regions called recursions exist within The Strange. Recursions are like tiny, self-contained universes. Each one operates under a particular set of rules, which means that that planet vores have almost as difficult a time entering a recursion as they do entering Earth. These are the things that exist in between all of that. In fact, a recursion can act as a barrier for preventing a planet vore from getting to Earth thanks to the presence of the recursion rules. And they talk about the recursion of Ardian, which is the one I played in in the game. The adventure I played in, in The Strange is we went to Ardian to do something. And in fact... I had my character that we translated to the other character, and Ardian is a, if I recall the way this was described to me from two years ago, it's basically like an MMO come to life. It's like a fantasy computer game world that's real. So you translate into this, and I translate into that, and I was like kind of like a ranger with a pet companion for the adventure and we went down into this tomb of a lost king to uh close whatever it was doing because it was something in the tomb i think was holding a portal open which was allowing things to get into earth and we had to go there to shut it down so things would stop coming in through um the recursion bubble or trans translating back and forth so it was interesting that i went from you know joe blow on the street he's an agent of um, like you said, they call it the estate. And I translate into Ar Ar Ardian, and there I'm a ranger with a pet companion, and I'm doing these missions and stuff that's going to affect. So I think what's cool about that is the game allows you to explore the idea of kind of like the show Sliders or any show where you're going to have, you're in the real world right now or present world, but you're going to be jumping 
or moving to other worlds, other realities, other universes, whatever you want to call them, multiverses, universes, whatever. So you can have your own flashpoint. You can have, we were talking about DC earlier, just before we started the show, where they talk about like Supergirl is from a different Earth than Flash in the CW universe at the moment, but they're still Earth 1, Earth 2, or whatever they want to call them. You can almost do that style of storyline with the strange the way the rpg is set up it's meant to be you're in one world and you're making excursions into other worlds and there's a lot of cool fantastic worlds out there that you can explore they give you several as starting points or things to say hey these are the ones that are out there that are stable there's some that pop up and go away and never come back there's some that are there all the time there's you know so you can always play all kinds of, of really cool things so this gives you a really fun angle for a GM and a player to explore lots of different worlds. And if you're a type of player, one of the things we talked about a little bit earlier before the show started was if you're a person who likes to have multiple characters, like you're that person that makes a character once a week because you have some concept come up, this is a game that kind of encourages that you as the player is probably going to have several different types of characters that you're going to play because you're going to go to several different worlds and when you translate to those worlds you're going to be different things when you get there and so that's kind of a really cool mechanic to encourage the idea that i'm not just one thing right that i'm, I'm many things or i can be many things i can play with different things so i i really like the idea of that um mechanics wise if you're just looking at mechanics it's a d20 system it works just like Numenera. There's GM intrusions. There's, if you roll a one, the GM can give you a complication. Your character sheets still have edge, might, and intellect. And you can, or I'm sorry, might, speed, and intellect, and you can spend edge. Um, you have pools and effort, just like you do in Numenera or in the Cypher system itself. But it really comes down to, like what you were talking about, the difference was the names of the three characters that you start with, which was, again, I believe it was Vector, Paradox and Spinner is, I think, the one you were forgetting, right? Was Spinner, I think, was the other one. And so those be kind of become the different things that you can be and you can do, which is just very, you know, just an interesting take on a modern but sci-fi kind of adventure. Although it was cool that I was in a modern sci-fi adventure and I still played basically a D&D &D adventure when I played the game I played it. So what do we want to talk about? Where do we want to go from there? I mean, we could look at skills or we could look at special abilities and backgrounds and things. We could talk about um, the ciphers that you get, which is usually a big part of any... Um, that's why they call it the cipher system. And they'll even say in the books, that's what makes cipher games stand out is the ciphers themselves. They're supposed to be like one-off magic items or one-off special ability items that your players get so often that they're willing to use quite often. You know, they don't just hoard them type thing. Um, we can talk about the character descriptors, which are really fun. Um, I like how they build a character. Like, what do you think about characters in general, PB, as far as... I love this idea that your character is a sentence. Your character isn't just a word, right? So it's not like when we, me and you sit down and you say, okay, PB, what are you going to play? And you're like, I'm going to play a ranger. Or I'm going to play a street cop. Or I'm going to play a scientist. Or I'm going to play this. It's never that. In the Numenera games, in the Cypher games, in the, the Strange games, you're going to play something that has a whole sentence to it, right? What, what do you think about how they've created those? And how do you feel about that kind of character creation and, and creativity? Well, I don't think it's unique to Monty Cook's gamings. I think that's something that goes through all RPGs. I don't play D&D &D and say, I am a rogue. <laughs> I say, I am a slew of things. You know, whenever I introduce myself in any of your games, I'm like, I'm a trident bard who, uh, you know, who's out of the water for the first time. And that's essentially the same thing you get with the Monty Cook games. You say... I'm a vector who, uh, I, just, I don't didn't read any of the names for the things they can do. I'm a vector who is who has this focus and this skill. Yeah, yeah. You usually a, have like a descriptor, the type, and then the vector. So like you like you're saying. So I could be a intelligent vector 
who adapts to any environment. Or I could be a skeptical paradox who carries a quiver. That one's pretty. That yeah. one's from Numenera. A tough spinner uh, who is licensed to carry. You know, there's just all these different things that you can come up with, and what that actually means, and what those actually are. Yeah, and so I think it's cool that that's how they do their descriptors. I think it's easier for uh, new players to just have that sentence out there that Monty could just really just cut through it and was just like hey these are this is all you need this is all you need to have a character when you want to come up with a character just have these three things and you're good you're fine um instead of other systems who never outright say that though that is essentially what you're doing you're picking your race your class your background um and you choose what your main weapon is going to be we essentially pigeonhole ourselves in those ways anyways so I think it's just cool that they do that just for new players. Um, and it's just easy, I guess, to understand how your character is going to, who your character is going to be, especially your, your just main body, your main version of yourself on Earth. As And it'll be easier when you're trying to describe who you are on a different, uh, in a different place. Though you are, are essentially are the same person, just you have different abilities if you choose to have them in a different reality but for essentially you're the same person yeah you just get the it's just like ready player one you get to be whoever you want but at the end of the day you still have your knowledge and your uh and all of that fun yeah stuff i kind of thought of it that way too like almost like we were entering a virtual world or that we were entering the matrix and then you became that thing inside there you could easily just say, like, if you were going to do a homebrew The Strange, you just want to use the rules and everything in it, but the one change you made was everything is a computer program that you're going into. Like, you sit down in a chair when you're ready to translate. You know, you could even use the same word, and then all of a sudden you're this other character when you go into this new computer world. So you could play games that are like uh, Sword Art Online. You could do any of those type of storylines. And... What I think is unique, well, not maybe unique. You're right when you say like a background makes you different than this. I think what's nice about the way they do their characters, the sentence, it allows you to be unique even if me and you chose something that was similar. So if me and you both wanted to play a vector or me and you both wanted to play a spinner, but yet we chose a different descriptor and a different focus, we would be very different we would play very different in the game, even though we were kind of the same. And that's, you can do that in Dungeons and Dragons. You can say, me and you are both going to be uh, rangers. I'll be the gloom stalker and you can be the hunter or, you know, whatever class. So you got your subclass that kind of breaks you out. And if you're a different race, that makes you slightly different. And if you have a different background, that makes you slightly different. I think this is kind of the same thing. As an example, if I just look at one of these here, if I take a descriptor at the moment, so something like clever, where it says you're quick-witted, I'm going to get a bonus to my intellect pool. I'm going to get to train in all interactions involving lies and trickery, so I can put that down on my character. I'm good at deception, as far as talking deception. And a skill I get is you're trained in defense roles to resist mental effects. Um, I'm trained in all tasks involving identifying, assessing danger, lies, quality, importance, function, and power. Uh, my inability is you were never good at studying or retaining trivial knowledge. So you get like a downside to it and it gets you a little equipment. The other thing that they linked to this, which I really liked, was the initial link to a starting adventure. So when you're building these characters, they give you some options to say, here's how you tie into the starting adventure. So I could say I, uh, you convinced one of the other PCs to tell you what she was doing. Uh, from afar, you observed that something interesting was going on, and that's how I got involved. You talked your way into situations because you thought it might earn you some money, or you suspect that one of the other PCs won't succeed without you. And those are kind of like my hooks to tie myself into the first adventure we're going to run and possibly to the other players that might be in the game I'm going to run, which I think is kind of a cool way to say, here's how this makes you a little bit different, even though me and you might pick Spinner to play or Vector or whatever. And then when we get to uh, the focus, there's lots of those. You get into the focus, and if we, I was trying to look for the one that I was. I must have been, because I had a pet. 
and I'm looking for which one it would have been, but lives in the wilderness feels like that's, that was the character I was playing. Like for some reason, I don't know why that is, but let me look at that one. Let me go to uh, lives in the wilderness and we'll give you an idea of that. So this is like the last part of your sentence typically. So you dwell in the wilds. You probably have done so most, if not all of your life, coming to understand the mysteries of nature, weather and survival, the ways of flora and fauna, you're rough and rugged. You get a connection through this. So your starting focuses chooses one of those and you get some equipment because of it. Um, you get a minor effect or a major effect that they tell you about. And then you'll get some abilities depending on what tier you're at. So like I get wilderness life, you're trained in climbing and swimming, and I have wilderness lore. And then later on, I get other stuff like living off the land, animal senses, wilderness awareness, the wild is on your side, those kinds of things. So all these things can build into what your abilities or character is going to do. So each one of those pieces might have to do with some type of stat increase. They might have to do with a tie into the adventure or other players. They might have to do with what equipment you're going to get or start with. Um, and then what abilities you have or are going to be have, including whatever else I choose, whether I'm vector spinner or paradox at that point. So it, it feels like a pretty robust character creation process. It doesn't seem to take too long in the amount of times that I've done them. Um, it's still about an hour and an hour and a half to make a, a, your first character, your first level character, and just go through it. They call them tiers instead of levels. Um, that might be a little bit of a difference. Other than that, I mean, there's just a lot of really neat stuff in here to, to kind of take a look at. Equipment uh, is your pretty standard stuff, but they have it broken out into earth equipment, uh, Ardian equipment. And then Rook equipment, some different excursion areas, but you could also make your own if you need to. Translation times, acclimation, initiating a translation. They have mechanics for how that happens. Um, there's lots of, there's some pre-gen characters in here. <clears throat> character creation walkthroughs, and then the, the character sheets are towards the back. I did want to point out one of the cool things about the character sheets are the way they come together. Um, when they built the Numenera character sheet, if I recall right, they made it a tri-fold character sheet on a piece of paper so that you could fold it in three ways and then you could flip through it like it was a three-way pamphlet to get to all the different things you wanted in your character sheet. The strange character sheets do this really cool thing where your main character sheet is almost like a folder and your other character sheets fit inside it, depending on when you translate and you become something else, which I thought was a really cool use of the paper character sheets. And I don't know if you can even see that if you're just looking at them like through the book or the PDF and you're looking at them. It doesn't make sense until you have them sitting on the table in front of you that they do that. When they handed them out to us at the table, I was like, oh, this is really cool how these things fit together. As I adjust my seat here. So I think one of the things that, I mean, maybe just to, to bring it around and wrap it up at this point, um, what are the things that we like about The Strange? I'll let you go first, PB. What are the things that make you maybe want to play in this game? What are the things that stand out to you as being interesting? What do you think people should keep an eye on or why they might be interested in it? Um, I think the main grab of The Strange is just the ability to go to different essentially worlds and the way that they sort of describe it in the book is that anything you really thought up now exists in the world and so they give examples of like um king arthur they talk about having merlin there they talk about moriarty from the sherlock worlds um they talk about in the beginning of the book there's a little like a two pages from the estate you know, telling you what it is you do now, what it is uh, the world's like now that you understand what the strange is, sort of. Um, and they have some great redacted lines there and they talk about star and then it's redacted. So you can have a world that's Star, world, uh, star Wars or Star Trek or um, you can create worlds that you know. You can live in the Earth 1 or Earth 38 from the Arrowverse. Or from, you know, the the comic books, you know, you can have your, you can run a superhero world there and you can have the first iteration, you can have your Flashpoint, you can have the new 52 um, run of it. Uh, you can go to your planet Hulk, 
you can go and uh, chill, like sort of like Legends of Tomorrow esque. Go chill with you know um, Merlin and Arthur and uh, Morgana. You know you can have you can live in your Doctor Who world and you could go talk to your eleven, twelve, or thirteen, fourteen, whichever Doctor <laughs> is your favorite. Um, I think that's the really main grab of it because all the mechanics of, are there, all the skins are there. Uh, the rules are very simple and it's very easy to reskin. It's sort of like the cipher system, and you can because of how monte cook games work you can just almost mesh those two systems together the cypher and the strange because it's essentially the same thing and have that adventure you can have your adventure in any fictional world you want um you can create your own worlds maybe you've always wanted to run a campaign but you never really finished that world but you know you have a good big bad evil guy and you sort of want to deal with him you can have that world now and that could be your you know the thing you do and then you'll have you, your guys go into a different world uh there's a lot of possibilities there and as for character creation and all of that i think it's very simple and i think it's uh uh it's, it's if you're someone who has a hard time coming up with a backstory for your character and uh working with very few options very broad options to be able to write a very specific background I think the Monty Cook uh, method is very good for you. So if you have new players, I think this game is good for you. Um, if you have people who have a hard time creating backstories or um, getting uh, specific descriptors for how their background works and how what their relationship with the world and other people are, I think Monty Cook is a very good way to... Uh, Monty Cook games are a very good way of doing that. I think the strange will be a very good way to get people to almost practice making characters and have consequence free character creation, which I think a lot of people will enjoy. Because although you do have your base character with a lot of the base skills that you have to keep, um, no matter what world you go into, I think uh, having the ability to change pretty much everything else going into a different world will be very, very helpful. And you get to kick ass. And it's, um, like I said, everything is very wishy-washy in Monty Cook games with, like, uh, if you're not someone who who's very tactical and wants to be like, okay, if I am five feet away from this character and then also 10 feet away from this, I can hit you with this and I can move here and hit you with that and then still be able to get away. If that's not sort of your thing, you just want to be like, are they close to me? Sure, I, I stab them. And then I will, you know... Uh, use this thing so I can do an extra attack or I can get get the heck out of there. Um, if that's sort of more of your deal, I think you're going to love this game. If you love a bunch of making characters like Lucian said, I think this is your game. And if you're a DM or GM who really likes making worlds, but you don't really like filling them out a ton, a ton, a ton, I think this is going to be great for you too. Yeah, all, everything you're saying makes me want to play this game. Yeah, so for <laughs> me, I'm thinking the highlights of the game are, and you you just nailed it. So I'm going to repeat a little bit of what you said, um, and and agree with you in in a lot of it because I think this system, the cipher system. Now, the strange was done by Bruce Cordell, which is part of the Monty Cook games. They've been, they've been working together since you know Dungeons and Dragons and probably even games before that. So these are veteran game designers, world builders that went on to create the Monty Cook brand and put these games out. And this is Bruce Cordell's version of the Cypher kind of system game. Um, what I like about it is it's very storytelling based system. It's all it's really good for theater of the mind gameplay. Not that you can't have a map and, and miniatures and, and tactical play, but it, it doesn't necessarily need that. And that's not where its strengths are. Its strengths are in descriptive storytelling with each other. Um, I do believe it's a very easy system to teach to somebody who's never played an RPG before. So you're going to meet those people who have been hearing about this craze, about all these people playing things like Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinders and, and uh, Powered by the Apocalypse games and Mass of the New Generation, all this stuff, Star Trek Adventures, uh, Tales from the Loop. And they're like, I want to get in on this. I want to play a game. Well, not every one of those games are great if they're the, your very first one, right? Because those some of them systems can be quite complicated. It might be hard to teach somebody some of those at first 
and then before diving in. But I think this style of game is very easy to teach somebody who's never played before. I also think that um, I love the idea that it gives the GM a lot of creative room in this game. Numenera does too, but this one even takes it to the next level. This one says, no matter what world I can think of, there's a reason it can exist in the strange and in my campaign and I can put my players into it or I can have them interact with it. And, and just like you said, you named off all kinds of great worlds that we could visit or we could be making up our own that you know nobody's ever heard of. There are no books or TV shows about them, but there are these cool and strange and epic places for our players to go through. Um, I think the character sheets are innovative. I think the way of just, it's a D20 system. I really love, and I pointed this out with Numenera, and I definitely want to point it out with uh, The Strange, is that the players do all the dice rolling. The the GM doesn't really need to do any dice rolling. It, it's all on the players and what's going on. So when they're about to be hit, they roll. When somebody's going to hit them, they roll. When they are going to hit other people, they roll. When they use a power, they roll. A power gets used against them, they roll. It's all on their you know, rolling of the dice, which I really like. Um, all done on a difficulty system. That's an easy math equation that you learn to do in your head. And then all of a sudden making checks and things is a very simple process. And you can, a simple game system allows you to make a nice, rich story because you can concentrate on that instead of all the minutia of rules to try to remember. Um, I think that's where the power of this game comes from. I think the artwork is fantastic. I think the world builders behind it put a lot of thought into the ones they give you to try out, but they give you plenty of room to come in and homebrew anything you want, and they encourage you to make anything you want. And there's quite a few supplements out for this. Just like Numenera had quite a few supplements that you could find out on Drive-Thru RPG, The Strange also has quite a few supplements. There's quite a few adventure books. There's quite a few extra resource um guides and books out there there's card systems for things you know cipher cards and things like that cipher decks so there's a lot of support for the game outside even though this game is now i want to say maybe two years since they released it maybe three i'd have to look up the actual release date i kind of forget but it's a really good system that i think is worth you checking out or at least put it on your radar so the next time drive through rpg does a, a sale and it's like half price or 25 percent off Pick this game up because I think it's definitely worth it to have in your library. Um, so I think that's a pretty good rundown of The Strange. Is there anything else you want to add, PB? Are we, we good? Nope, I'm good. All right. So usually towards the end of our show, the last thing we like to do is try to keep uh, you appraised of any of the Kickstarters that we are keeping an eye on or interesting to me and PB. Do you have anything uh, that you want to bring up for this week? Yep, I have two things uh, that are both RPG related, uh, not so much actual games this uh, this week. So the first one is everyone's most well-known RPG. It is D and D, um, and they for I don't remember what the what the day was. It was like a workplace uh, get rid of homophobia in your workplace or something like that. I don't really. I don't really remember what the day was, um, but a lot of companies were were celebrating it, and Wizards of the Coast was one of them. And so, for the event, they are fundraising to help support LGBTQ youth in their community, and they're selling uh, shirts with their yeah, signature cool dragon ampersand with the uh, with a rainbow going across them. Their goal is to sell five five thousand. Right now, they're at. 4,847. They've raised $64,000 so far, and there's three days to go for it. So I'll throw the link in chat for anyone who is interested. Yeah, I'll and get the, one. I gotta buy one. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is uh, one that I'm very happy to see doing very well. I actually saw this go up on Tumblr a few a few weeks ago, and I'm happy to see it's still doing well. This Kickstarter has 68 hours to go. This is by someone named Becca Farrow, and they are making enamel pins, D20 enamel pins, uh, with all the different um, pride flags on it, uh, with all the different sides of the D20. So they're all for for pride. There are uh, the 
the basic LGBTQA one, there is a trans flag one, a bi flag, an ace flag, an asexual flag, a pansexual flag, a lesbian uh, flag. They now have the aromantic, non-binary, a gender, genderqueer, poly polyamorous. They also now have stickers they've added because this is doing really well. They now have a beanie, which looked really good, by the way, and a backpack specially made uh, with embroidery with the D20, but also specifically to fit all your oddly large, tall D&D &D books and Pathfinder books and all of that. It's very large. It's to fit everything you'll ever need. It's a great Kickstarter. Again, it is called... Where's the name? Pride Check. Pride Dice Enamel Pins and now more. They're doing very well. You have uh, 68 hours to go on this one and I would recommend it for anyone. They're all very cheap and I think it's for a great cause, especially now that, uh, like I said, June is Pride Month. So mm -hmm. go get one of those things if that is sort of your thing. Yeah, I definitely want the t-shirt. I think that'd be a great one. I want to have one to, to wear around Gen Con and have the different game-related shirts because I, I keep buying t-shirts that aren't game-related and I just keep thinking, I need more game-related t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> I got to show them my hobby. You got to gotta wear it proudly. Um, so for my side of it, uh, I just got one thing I was going to point out. Uh, I did just get finally, uh, well, not finally, like, I was expecting it, but um, I had helped a Kickstarter that was called the uh, Baby Beastery Books. So they did a volume one and then they did a Kickstarter for volume two and I backed volume two and I just got at the level where I got book one and two. Um, so I just got my PDFs for that and these are fantastic um, resources if you want to have little small baby creatures of all these kind of cool things from Dungeons and Dragons and then work them into your campaign. So like ha having a baby manicor or having a baby nightmare or a baby unicorn or a baby, uh, they had all kinds of cool ones like uh, a, a bullet or even things like a centaur was one that was in there, which is kind of relevant for this week. Um, so it was really fun. I got those PDFs and it was really cool uh, to see those. The Kickstarter that's going right now that I'll point out now, me and PB at the end of these shows are always talking about Kickstarters. So if you go back to the previous episodes, you'll find other Kickstarters that we talked about, which they're really good and they could definitely use your support. Some are still going, some are at the end. You know, check them out if you can. The one uh, that's going right now is No Thank You Evil. That's the Monty Cook one. They ran out of their entire stock at their store of this game. So they're doing a Kickstarter to re to kind of re-supply um, everybody that wants to get a copy of this. So they're using a Kickstarter to basically republish this game. So it's not different. It's not a different version. It's just a republish because they had ran out of the original uh, set that they had printed. And so now it's out there. So uh, you can go out to, at the Kickstarter site, it's called uh, No Thank You Evil. And what it is, it's their game that is a cooperative storytelling game meant for kids. Um, one of the things they did some videos for it to show you there's lots of people out there it's one of the games that i've seen lots of younger kids gm for other kids too so it allows um the young people to get started in running games themselves and having an understanding of trying to run an rpg game it's a great introductory for rpgs for the young ones um, and so no thank you evil award-winning tabletop game of creative make-believe adventure and storytelling so, I mean, you, you can't beat that. And a lot of this stuff gets bought. And many of these went to at-risk areas. So they went to at-risk centers or places that would have them available for kids that would come for, like, after-school activities or even, you know, just any of those things where kids can come in and f in a safe space be able to play and, and do other things. They have they were buying these this board game for that, this RPG for that. And I think it's something that we could all support, um, and I think it's really cool. There's lots of pledge levels. There's lots of uh, goals that you can help them reach. They've already um, hit their goal, so they're definitely working on past that at this point. 744 backers. Um, so it went pretty well. It's still running right now if you want to jump in on it. So definitely go check that out. Um, Shauna uh, Germain was one of the people that was a main developer on it, and she is out there on Twitter right now really hyping it up, and it's definitely something that's worth it. Um, there's a lot of good work there that uh, I think you could get into. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that even if you don't have kids, it, it looks like it's a really fun game, lots of cool, fun artwork, 
and it could just be a fun storytelling game to play with just about anybody. Um, so that is the one I would keep an eye out. I'm still excited for the ones that I'm in. I'm waiting for my books. The, the Coville Kickstarter's done. I'm waiting to get my stuff from that. I'm waiting to get stuff from Overlight. I'm waiting to get stuff from all these different ones I keep jumping into. Uh, I just did Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition. I just got in on that one also. And I got the pre-order for that. So hopefully I get that in June. Lots of RPGs coming. Hopefully we'll put them on the channel and we'll get to go. Um, so I think with that, that is our show for this Sunday night. I brought us in. So PB, how about you take us out? Well, thank you all again for watching. And if you have any topics that you want us to talk about, feel free to give them to us over on Twitter at Standard Array. And Lucian, what are you doing this week and uh, what do you have planned? Uh, yeah, so you can catch me and anything I'm doing over at at Sir Lucian Gaming, all one word for Twitter. I usually post what I'm doing or I'll put out a tweet if I'm about to stream. Um, right now, you can also find me on uh, twitch.tv forward slash Sir Lucian, one word, or you can go to youtube.com forward slash Sir Lucian, one word, and you can find the videos there. This week, uh, hopefully we're running our tomb of annihilation on tuesday but before i get to that tomorrow night i'm going to be playing a teenage mutant ninja turtles rpg with a fan from one of our shows um asked said hey i would love to run this game if you'd want to be a player do you want to play in it and i'm like sure i'll play in an rpg i love teenage mutant ninja turtles i loved them since the 80s and i still love them now so i'm going to get to play a teenage mutant ninja turtle game uh tomorrow night i don't know if it's stream but if it is Keep an eye on Twitter because I'll, I'll definitely post it and maybe even record it and see if I can get it put up. Um, then Tomb of Annihilation Adventure League on Tuesday night. I think we didn't play last week, so I'm hoping we play this week. Uh, I'm finally getting pretty close to level 5 at this point. So I need to make some big decisions before I hit level 5 and have to lock my character down, my Barbarian. Um, then I have my Thursday night game, which is my... West Marches Borderlands game. That's going really fun. That's uh, building to a nice crescendo as they are tackling a big boss coming up. And then uh, Friday, we're going to run a one-shot, mm, secret one-shot of Dungeons & Dragons 5e game uh, that I'll be announcing throughout the week. So keep an eye on that. We're going to play that on Friday night starting at, I just want to say 8 p.m. or 8.30 p.m. Might be 8.30 p.m. because we got one of the players gets home a little later. Um, 8 30 p.m eastern and then saturday morning you can join me with my co-host jordan the ph is silent from forgotten realms explained for the saturday morning D, D show so as you can see super busy lots of stuff rpg related going on that is my week coming up <laughs> all right and i'm pb from pb blades inside you can find me on literally pretty much any big social media facebook twitter youtube twitch and instagram um and this week what do i have coming on i have the same tomb of annihilation game coming up on wednesday i do my character my game creation for band battles since it will be titled and uh, this week we're going to be going really hard on the uh figuring out what each of the attributes of our characters are going to be and the mechanics are there and also our skills i believe is what i call it so specialties that's what i call them specialties and attributes so good and bad so we're going to go in on those i've been having ideas all week so i'm pretty excited to get back into it this wednesday um thursday and friday and uh, nope i don't do anything thursdays fridays and mm -hmm. saturdays i'm streaming i think i'm going to be doing a lot more super meat boy so probably uh, Saturday, Super Meat Boys, and Friday's Mass Effect. Maybe, maybe I'll, we'll switch those around. IDK, and we have obviously Sandra Ray on 9 p.m. Eastern Standard, Eastern Standard Time here on Sir Lucian's channel. As for other things that are coming up for me, I am writing two one shots one for one to three levels in DD, and another one that's five to eight. Um, and uh, those are both going to be uh, LGBTQ themed uh, in celebration for pride month coming up in june hopefully they're they'll both be out early june hopefully it's the first time i do i write anything like that so you know 
we can only hope that I stay on schedule. And then I'm also writing an extra little thing for a festival that you can add in that it will be like a D&D themed pride fest that you can throw into your games and uh, just have, you know, a cool day sometime in June in your games. And you can play with that. And uh, hopefully people will enjoy that and have some fun incorporating real life events into their D&D games. So yeah, that is what I have going on this week. Once again, I would like to thank everyone for stopping by watching and you on YouTube. Thank you for watching and getting all the way through here. Um, all mm -hmm. the Kickstarters I'm sure will be down in the description whenever this video comes out. And um, follow us on the Standard Array over on Twitter. Again, all your suggestions over there. Or you could uh, tweet either me or Lucian over on Twitter, Sir Lucian Gaming and PB Played Inside, respectively. And have some great gaming this week, and we hope to see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.